Greetings, Crew Towns, and welcome to Codex Compliant. Do you perchance have a moment to talk about the greater good? It's kind of wild to think that the Tau, a faction introduced to Warhammer 40,000 in 2001, are still the last completely new faction added to the game. Sure, there have been new factions added since then, but they've all either been a variant of an existing faction or something that was previously established in the canon. But the Tau, they were the genuine article, something entirely new for the grim darkness of the far future. And since we've managed to avoid talking about these guys for four years in this series, we thought we'd take a look at the 3rd edition codex from 21 years ago. But first, where did the idea for Tau come from anyway? About a decade before the Tau were released, a teenager called Gav Thorpe, who you might have heard of, came up with an idea for an alien race called the Shiselian League, a caste-based society that were based on the four elements and ruled over by a psychic fifth caste called the Spirit Caste. There were effectively lizard men in space, and Gav wrote reams of background and drew up concept sketches for them. Around the turn of the millennium, Gav was now a well-known fixture of Games Workshop, and there was a desire to create an all-new faction for 40k. So Gav convinced them to give his old Chiselian League idea a go, marrying those old background details with a desire to have a mecha-themed army and retooling it into the Tau, later the Tau, and eventually the Tau. The caste-based system of the Chassel remained, but the psychic ruling class was replaced by the specifically non-psychic ethereals. This young race of highly advanced behooved blue buggers were accompanied by their Krut allies, who were originally envisioned as an entirely mercenary faction and previously appeared in the 3rd edition rulebook. However, due to some restructuring of the way the game's development teams were organised at GW, it meant that this 2001 Codex debut of the Tau was not actually written by Gav, but instead was written by Andy Chambers, Pete Haynes and Graham McNeil, with cover art by Adrian Smith giving us our first look at this new faction. Also, if you're interested in the design of the Tau, track down issue 262 of White Dwarf. It has a lot of super interesting bits of information and art. Like, for example, did you know that Crisis Suits were originally play-tested using vehicle rules? Also, this issue has a lot of biological information on the Tau that probably should have been in the Codex, but what do we know? Anyway, the Tau were described in this Codex as a young race, first discovered by humans around 6,000 years prior, with the little blue baboos having just discovered fire. Since the Imperium is, well, the Imperium, the planet of Tau was immediately earmarked for colonization and its native population to be eradicated. However, the ships sent to begin the process were lost in a violent warp storm, and little more was thought of the planet since the Imperium was then distracted with the whole Age of Apostasy thing. Cloaked by the warp storm, the town developed quickly, splitting into tribes and creating a civilization which, as they tend to do, also figured out how to do a war. And they were quite good at it, or bad at it, depending on your perspective. Conflict decimated the young race, creating conditions for a virulent plague, further diminishing their numbers. That was until the Ethereals appeared and told everyone they were being very, very silly and that they should all work together for the greater good, and that wonderful things could be accomplished like that. The Ethereals spoke with a great deal of authority, and their words convinced the warring factions to join together, and use their individual talents to allow the Tau to thrive, leading to the version of them we see today as an advanced caste-based space-faring race with many alien allies, a faction maybe not as mired in the cynicism of the setting. For example, it's stated that it took them quite a while and a lot of conflict before they realised that the Orcs weren't really going to want to be a part of their little empire. Considering what we know about the Orcs, that's adorably naive. The Tau's relationship with humanity shown in this book is one where they're perfectly happy to trade with humans and even accept them into their ranks, but the Imperium doesn't like any of that one bit, and launched an all-out offensive, the Damocles Crusade, on the Tau Empire wanting to cease any alien contamination. Thankfully for the Tau, their advanced technology and allies were able to bring the Imperial advance to a standstill long enough to negotiate peace partially due to the Imperium looking over its shoulder and seeing the impending arrival of Hive Fleet Behemoth. It's easy to see how they came across as the closest thing to good guys that 40k has to a lot of people, especially at this early point before more material came out and grim darked them up a little. Although, granted, there are plenty of hints in here that they're maybe not exactly squeaky clean, and being kinda condescending the whole time whilst doing it. But even then, they still seem positively utopian compared to the Imperium of Man. 
Also, and this is a pet peeve of mine, but unless a later codex that I haven't got to yet has an ethereal go on like a two-page rant about the means of production, I'm just gonna say that the rigorously enforced caste system alone probably disqualifies them from being referred to as communist by any sensible definition, whatever the memes may say. There's even a little segment talking about the tactics employed by the Firecast, where they notably say that they are perfectly okay with falling back in order to preserve Tau lives. Tau attribute no dishonour to prudent retreat, and see last stands as a lack of imagination or the last refuge of an incompetent commander. You can see why they don't get on well with the Imperium. Like, half the art of Space Marines is heroic last stands. So yeah, the introduction we got to the Tau's lore was surprisingly detailed, telling us where they're from and why they are the way they are. But leaving just enough mystery around things like ethereals to ponder on their origin and why they hold the status they seem to do in Tau society. To move on to the army list, for HQ choices you had commanders in Chasse O and L varieties and ethereals. The commanders, equipped with highly customizable crisis suits, could take a bodyguard of one to two crisis suited pals, and ethereals gave a morale boost to those nearby but could also cause the entire army to try and run away if they were to get killed. To be polite, they seem like a bit of a liability. For elites, they had more crisis suits and stealth teams. Interestingly, these are explicitly XV-15 stealth suits, whereas the newer ones are XV-25s, making the newer real-world plastic kit represent an actual advancement of their technology over the old metal models. I don't know, it's, it's a fun touch. For troops, you had access to fire warriors and crude carnivore squads. Crute in particular had a few interesting quirks, like how by default they had no armour at all, but you could buy a 6 plus save for 1 point per model, which increases their leadership since it's tied to their points cost, which represents their mercenary nature. Apparently. The Crute's propensity to eat the dead was represented by the fact they must take a leadership test before performing a sweeping advance if they won in close combat. Failing that role meant that they were too enamoured with snacking on their fallen enemies to chase down the survivors. They could also have Crute Hounds and Crutox Riders join their squads to make larger combined Crute-based blobs, even though they were all bought as separate units. Fast attack was nice and simple with gun drone squadrons, pathfinder teams and Crute Hound packs, and heavy support was broadsides, hammerheads, and crutoxes. Rounding out the list were devilfish transports, which pathfinders absolutely had to take regardless of how you planned to use them. But then again, having a few extra devilfish lying around isn't exactly an issue for reasons we'll get to in a moment. As for the weapons and war gear all of these things were using, pulse rifles having a 30 inch range was strange as, for whatever reason, 30 was one of the multiples of 6 they generally didn't use at the time, especially for rapid fire weapons. Jetpacks, which are legally distinct from jump packs, were fun, allowing you to move again in the assault phase, and by fun I mean infuriating to play against. Also, railguns being 72 inch strength 10 AP1 was a lot. The only other strength 10 weapon in 3rd edition with that kind of range that I can think of is the Shadow Sword's Volcano Cannon, and that was on a super heavy, meant for hunting titans. Of course, the trade-off was that outside of the Crute, their melee abilities were almost non-existent, as is tradition, with the only melee weapon option available only for ethereals, although I'm not sure how confident I'd feel about putting one into melee with anything even slightly decent at it. Not even sure I'd be okay putting them near Grotz, to be honest. The good at shooting, bad at melee thing is even backed up by a quote from the ever so eloquent Warlord Skarmork, the Great Despoiler. They got dead big shooty guns. That'll kill tons of boys, but if you can get near them, then you got a chance. Just gotta make sure you bring loads of boys, cause you ain't gonna have a whole lot left when you get close enough to crump them didn't really know how to segue to the next section, so uh, here's an ad for some shirts. For as long as mankind has existed, so have clothes. Probably I, I didn't check. Previously acquiring them was an arduous process involving learning how to sew, but now, with the advent of the internet, it has never been easier. The exceptionally bold and, dare I say it, 
handsome of you, can even follow the link in the description to the official Sniping With merch store, where several new designs are now available, including this one that I made when I was left unsupervised. There are even items not intended for wearing, but when are your parents and what you do with them on your own time is none of our business. So head on over to the Sniping With merch store today. You won't regret it. Unless you do. We now return to the Transformers. So, let's address the devil fish in the room. The Fish of Fury. The 3rd edition Tau Codex is where the infamous Fish of Fury tactic originates from. For those that haven't encountered it, it was a tactic where you'd place a couple of devil fish in front of some troops, and due to the fact that devil fish were quite large and tough for a transport, it meant it was incredibly difficult to assault those Tau troops as you'd have to go all the way around them, something particularly difficult with 3rd edition's assault rules. Plus, if you assaulted the devil fish themselves to try and get them out of the way, you could only hit them on a 6+, plus as they were skimmers, which is also why the Tau troops can just shoot underneath them. So taking down that little gun line became incredibly difficult for anything assault based, and whatever you did you had to do so whilst also being shot with pulse rifles. Also you could upgrade the devilfish to make them even more awkward to kill if you really wanted. Of course you could just take it down with some heavy anti-tank fire, but if you're firing at the devilfish then you're not firing at the hammerheads that are about to atomize everything you hold dear. The Fisher Fury tactic has varied in effectiveness and application throughout different codexes and editions, but it's just one of those tactics that people remember, especially because this early iteration of it was so difficult to deal with. A fun little touch that we didn't really know where else to mention, so we'll mention here, is that they state that any battlesuit wearer that takes the bonding knife upgrade, a ceremonial knife not used in combat that meant the squad could regroup even at half strength, would usually just paint a knife design onto their suit's armour to represent it. I suppose because strapping a valuable ceremonial object to the outside of your walking tank would probably seem in poor judgement. Again, it's pretty easy to see why them and the Imperium don't exactly get along. There were also a couple of special characters to choose from. Commander Farsight and the ethereal Orn Shi. Orn Shi was more adept at using an honor blade than a regular ethereal, and was able to inspire the troops around him with his, uh, rippling abs. Farsight, otherwise known as the coolest Tau, realized that a crisis suit wielding a sword would be the raddest thing imaginable, with his alien Dawnblade being powerful enough that he counted as a monstrous creature in close combat. And you don't even have to know 3rd edition's rules to know that that kind of thing is why he is the coolest Tau. Granted, the fact that he comes from a breakaway faction of Tau that has spent way too long fighting orcs meant that an army led by him's resources were extremely limited, with many units like Kroot completely unavailable and heavy hitters like Broadsides and Hammerheads limited. But at least you could upgrade units to improve their weapon skill and initiative by one for five points a model. You know, on account of all the orcs they fought. You know, every time I hear about them I get one step closer to just collecting a Farsight Enclave's army. To wrap up the gameplay stuff, there was also a new scenario included, Hostage Situation, in which an Ethereal was forced to eject from their ship and their life pod has landed in the middle of the map. The town must try and hold it by the end of the game, lest their opponents capture and kill their leader. Which, notably, is not a hostage situation by any metric. Finally, the colour section of the Codex is pretty neat. Not just because it comes from the slim period of time where goblin green rimmed but not actually topped bases were common on studio armies. God, the mad bastards even rimmed the drone flight stands. No, it was neat because it contained a fair amount of hobby information with tips for assembling and painting various units, big, small and bitey, and they're all relatively achievable. We're also big fans of the camo Tau paint schemes that were shown. They are one of the factions that would be more likely to actually use it, so, you know, that's cool. And there is something very appealing about this page of multicolored Kroot. They look like a list of palette swaps of a generic enemy from a 16-bit platformer, and we're very here for it. So, after putting off covering them for a while, how do we find the first Tau Codex we've covered? Well, it does a really good job establishing the faction and carving out their particular niche. Sure, they've been elaborated upon a lot and they've gained a ton of new units since then, but as an introduction to the little blue folk with the big old guns, it certainly did the job. 
And hey, now that we've covered the Tau, we've pretty much covered all the Xeno races in one form or another. What are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm not pricing up a Farsight Enclave army or anything. Sh- shut up. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you remember Rana from a few videos ago. Now, your likes and subscriptions and comments and such, they really did help her like pull out of the funk that she was in. But, uh, you know what? She's not feeling so good again, so uh, if you could, you know, go and engage with this video in, in the ways that please the algorithm, you'll make her so much happier, you know? See? See, she's feeling better already. She can, she can sense them. She can sense them. I just want to let you know that all of your likes and comments and subscriptions really did make her feel better. <laughs>